Today's reading is out of Joshua 1.8. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. The word of the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. So I'm Bill Sy, one of the pastors here, and uh, glad to have the opportunity to be with you this morning. Is there anybody here who loves to read instructions? Me neither. I just got a brand new hose so I could water my tomato plant, and I couldn't believe it. Wrapped around the hose were these instructions. <laughs> what? At least five different times it says instructions, read before use, read before use, read before use. And it says if you don't read it and use it properly, injury can result. He squirted himself to death? <laughs> how, how did he die? Tomatoes. <laughs> Ate too many? No, watering. He got attacked by the hose. I mean, he's like, don't you get tired of reading instructions? It's like every single new thing I get, I have to read instructions or I have to watch a video YouTube. It's like, ah, oh, I'm tired of this. But would you be willing to read instructions if something was able to change your life for the better, was able to turn your anxieties into peace, your fear into courage, your sadness into joy, your purposelessness into meaningfulness. Well, there is a book like that. What is that book? It's the Bible. Somebody said B-I-B-L-E stands for Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. This book has the power to change our lives. And that's why I love this verse that was just read by Dustin from Joshua 1.8. Let's look at that verse again. It says, keep this book of the law or the Bible always on your lips. Now, that's interesting. Not just in front of your eyes, not just in your ears, but on your lips. What does that mean? It means that we speak those words, we recite those words we say them out loud, and it says you meditate on this book. You think about it day and night. You're constantly letting the Word be in your heart, in your mind, on your lips. And when you do that, the promise is you will be prosperous and successful. Now, that doesn't mean you'll be rich and famous, but it does mean you'll have everything you need, and your life will have meaning and purpose. How many of you have ever tried reading the Bible and you got stuck somewhere? So often the mistake we make is uh, we think that, well, it's a book, and we always start at the beginning with books, but in reality, the Greek word, the original word for Bible is actually biblos, which means books, plural. This is actually a library of books, a collection of books. And when you go to a library and you want to read a book, do you, do you have to say, okay, I, I'm in the library, so I should go to the first shelf and read the first book I find, whether or not it's something I'm interested in? No. You go into a library, you find a subject that you care about, and you start reading. In the same way with the Bible, I encourage people when they're starting, read in the New Testament. Start with the Gospel of John or Mark, Luke, then Acts, maybe Romans. Read some of the Psalms. Because it's so easy to get stuck and then get discouraged on some of the first few books. You know, and I've even heard people say, I tried reading the Bible and I, I didn't get anything out of it. I'm not going to ever do that again. And, and it's kind of like if you would go to a restaurant. Do you ever go to a restaurant and the meal you serve, they serve you, it's just you don't like it. It's not good. And so do you say, well, I'll never go to a restaurant again for the rest of my life. I tried that once. No. The reality is, this book is a collection of 66 books written over 1,500 years by 40 different people, but one author, God, and he's got one message in this book, and the message is, I love you, and I want to have a relationship with you. I want to be your heavenly father. And so he invites us to get into this book. Don't be discouraged by what we don't understand. Just believe what you do understand. I remember a few weeks ago, Pastor Greg quoted uh, Mark Twain, who said, I'm not bothered by the things I don't understand. I'm bothered by the things I do understand. And so God is going to open our eyes to this word. And I want to share with you today four different ways of reading the Bible that I have found very helpful. 
And so I'm making this an acrostic. The word is read, read the Bible, R-E-A-D. Each of those letters stands for something. And the first letter, R, stands for receive. Number one on your outline, this is in the worship folder, sermon notes. The R stands for receive, receive the word from God to you. In other words, believe that this book is a message from God's heart to you. God wants to speak to you. And that verse in 1 Thessalonians 2.13 says, when you received the Word of God, and that word receive means to welcome. You know, like if you, if, you, if you receive a person, you welcome them into your life. That's what the word receive means. Have that attitude toward the Bible. I, I, I welcome it. It means to personally take something and make it yours. So when I'm reading the Bible, I, I'm going to believe this is something for me. When you received the Word of God, 1 Thessalonians 2.13, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is the Word of God, which is at work in you who believe. Now, the word work there means, uh, it's, our, it's our English word, energy. It means that the Word is alive, it's got energy. When you receive it and when you believe it, it's working, it's doing something inside of you. Whether you understand it, whether you feel it, it is doing something in you. It's like when you eat a meal. How many of you can remember what you had for dinner yesterday? Oh, let's see. I think we had spaghetti. <laughs> How about lunch? Yeah, it's like, well, I don't know. But this is what I do know. It was important for me to eat. And that's how the Word is. You don't always get a thrill out of it. You don't always feel like, oh, I'm so inspired. But it does something in you. It nourishes you. It feeds you. It does a work in you if you'll just believe it. So I like to encourage people that this is not a book about God. This is a book from God. It's a message to you. I like to think of it as a love letter. Have you ever received a love letter? I used to while we were dating. And uh, that was like a long time ago. And, and, and Jody was in Ohio. I was in New York. And during the summer, we didn't see each other. So we would do this thing. I know you've never heard of it before, but it's called write a letter. Now, it's kind of like emailing or texting, except you have to put a stamp on it. You have to put it in the mailbox. And you have to wait. You have to wait like a week or 10 days to hear from that person. But it made the answer so special. I'd go to the mailbox, did it come today? Oh, it didn't come today, maybe tomorrow. Maybe the next, oh, it came today. I take that envelope, I hold it to my heart, I'm so excited, I'm walking, I'm walking down the driveway, I can't wait to get up to my room where I can open it and just read it. Now, how do I read that letter? See, this is what's critical, because sometimes when we read the Bible, we overanalyze things we make it so complicated that we miss the love that God is trying to give to us. So when I'm reading this letter, the first thing it says is, Dear Bill. Now I can stop there and ask a question. What does it mean, dear? Does she say that to everybody she writes to? Does she say, I'm look, I, I, I look like a dear? <laughs> and, and why didn't she say, dear rest? Later on she did. But the point is, this is a love letter. Don't overanalyze it. Don't make it too complicated. Receive the love that's in the Word. Now, as you grow as a Christian, you'll discover there's tools, there's books you can use to help you understand the background. You can get involved in a Bible study at the church. But I just want to encourage you, don't make it so complicated that you get discouraged. Just read it and believe it and let God work it in you. Probably one of the most difficult books in the whole Bible to understand is Revelation, right? If you've ever tried that. But I love this verse in Revelation 1, verse 3. Revelation 1, verse 3 says this. It says, blessed is the one who reads the words, and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart. It doesn't say anything about having to understand it. I have read Revelation a million times. I don't understand it. But I believe it. I read it. And it says you'll be blessed if you do that. There is a blessing in simply reading the Word. And I want to encourage you, don't get discouraged because you don't understand everything. Simply read it. You know, there's even a verse in the Bible that says parts of the Bible are hard to understand. Oh, that made me feel good. Second Peter 3.16 says parts of the Bible are hard to understand. 
Yeah, because God is a lot smarter than we are. And so when he thinks his thoughts are way beyond ours, his ways are beyond ours, so it doesn't bother me that I don't understand everything. I just believe it's true. And one of the things I found helpful before I start reading the Bible is simply to ask God to help me understand it. See, this is what is so unique about reading the Bible. It's the only book I know that when you read it, you can have the author sit down beside you. Is that cool? I mean, can you imagine any other book you're reading? You can't ask the author, you know, what's this about? But you can with this. And there's a verse in Psalm 119, and it's on your outline there, verse 18. Will you read it out loud with me? This would be a great prayer to pray whenever you're going to read the Bible. Psalm 119, verse 18. Let's read it. Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. Isn't that great? Open my eyes, Jesus, so I can see wonderful things. Now, by yourself, you can see some things. You can grasp some things in the Bible. But wouldn't you rather see wonderful things? That's what God does. When he opens your eyes, you'll see things that you never imagined were there. And don't you sometimes, with your own natural understanding, you know, you know get confused, get mixed up, uh, misread, mishear things? I remember that happened to us about 10 years ago. We were getting ready to leave San Diego to move to uh, uh, the Bay Area where our last church was, and we were down to the last week before we moved, so the movers are coming in one week. Can you feel the tension? It's like, we've got one week. We've got to finish packing. We've got to clean the house one week. And then Jody, my wife, said, look what I found. I, I forgot we had these. She found tickets to SeaWorld. Someone had given us these tickets. And here we live in San Diego. We forgot to go. We've got to go. Oh, and they've got a new dolphin show. We've got to see this. You know, these, these big fish are going to jump up in the air and do tricks. Oh, we don't have time to go to SeaWorld. We've got to go to SeaWorld. So being a good husband, I said, you know, we'll go. And so we are, uh, first thing, we have to line up to find a parking space. 45 minutes in line in the parking. And then the man said, that'll be $12. I thought, this is not Disneyland. $12. I said, I don't have to pay. I showed him. I said, I have free tickets. He said, you still have to pay for parking. Oh, so I had to pay for parking. I said, just show me the dolphins. Take me the dolphins. And then the dolphin people said, you can't just come in here. You have to have a wristband to get in line to watch the dolphin show. Oh, where do I get the, the wristband? Go over to that tent over there. Stand in line 45 minutes to get a wristband. I said, when is the show going to start? I want to see the next one. They said, you missed the first show. It, the next one isn't for four hours. <laughs> but don't get there in four hours. You have to get there an hour early because everybody wants to see the new dolphin show. Oh, my goodness, I've got so much to do, and I'm wasting all this time standing in line. So now I'm in line the hour ahead, and it's hot and sweaty. It's not supposed to be that way in San Diego. It's like Sacramento. I'm just dying. And then I heard those words that gave me hope. They said, the first 12 rows, snow cone. I said to Jody, I said, did you hear that? They said that the first 12 rows who get in there get a free snow cone. That's going to cool us off. It's a reward for standing in line all this time. So uh, that's why there's all these people here. They all want the snow cone. So I said, as soon as they let us in, we're going to run. We're going to get those seats. So that it's our time. We finally we go, we run in, and I'm heading for those 12 rows. And then I see this big sign that says, Soak Zone. <laughs> no snow cone. Soak Zone. That's how we're going to cool off. They're going to splash dirty fish water on us. <laughs> but that's not what God does. When we ask him to open our eyes to his word, he splashes living water on us. And that water cleanses us, it revives us, it renews us. Jesus said in John 15, he said, my word cleanses you. There's something about the word that cleanses you, renews you. Billy Graham said, the word has a purifying power and effect on our lives. Don't ever miss the opportunity every day to study the Word. And then somebody who was at the, uh, the first service sent me an email this morning, and he said he saw a sign at another church, and it said, dust on your Bible means dirt in your life. 
Dust on your Bible means dirt in your life. See, because the Word will cleanse you. So ask Jesus, open my eyes to see your Word. And it says that's what Jesus did when he was on the earth. It says in Luke 24, 45, he opened their minds so they could understand the Scripture. So that's the letter R. Receive this as a word from the Lord. It's, it's a love letter to you. Ask him to open your eyes so you can see that love for you. Number two, the letter E in read, R-E-A-D, the E stands for expect, expect the Word to show you Jesus. This is an amazing thing to me. The whole Bible is really all about Jesus. And it says in Luke 24, verses 27 and 44, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus explained to them, to his disciples, what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. In other words, he says, I'm in the whole thing. I'm in all of it. Even in the Old Testament where you don't see my name, Jesus, I'm there. And it says in Luke 24, 44, everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses. What's the law of Moses? It's the first five books, the Torah. He said, I'm in there. I'm in the prophets. I'm in the Psalms. I'm in the whole book. Wow. And so what happens is, God opens my eyes, and I'll read something in the Old Testament. It's like, that's a picture of Jesus. That's a reminder of who Jesus is, what Jesus is going to do. So, for example, right now I'm reading the book of Leviticus. Is that a fun one or what? <laughs> All these gruesome sacrifices. I said, God, why on earth did you put this in here? But then it was like he said... Because you need to understand that all these sacrifices that they had to offer, these sacrifices were all summed up in one sacrifice that Jesus gave his life once and for all. And so when you read this book, as, as tedious as, as it is, just be thankful that Jesus took all this stuff for you. Oh, I love you, Jesus. I'm going to get through this book, I'm, and I'm going to say, thank you, Lord, what you've done for me. It's all about Jesus. Jesus himself said in John 5, verses 39 and 40, you diligently study the Scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life, but these are the Scriptures that testify or point to me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. What? That means it is possible to be a Bible scholar to know all this book and know all about it and know the culture and the history and yet still miss the main point. The main point is you have a heavenly Father who loves you, loved you so much he sent his son Jesus so you could have a relationship with Jesus and in Jesus you'll have real life. If you don't get connected to Jesus because of this book, you've missed the whole point of the book. It's all about Jesus. I liked what uh, Ryan said last week. You know, I, I, I always say too, if I, when I read the Bible in the morning, if I can just get one thing out of it, I'm happy. I do that with sermons. I think if I can just get one thing out of a sermon, I'm happy. Just one thing. I, I don't have to understand everything. Just let me get one thing. And here's the one thing I remember from what Ryan said last week. Now, isn't that terrible? I mean, he went on and on, and, and all I remember is one thing. But I'm excited. <laughs> The one thing I remember he said is we should be talking to Jesus all day long. And see, that's really what reading the Bible is. Reading the Bible is you getting to sit down with Jesus and just enjoy this special friendship you have with Jesus. So number two, expect the Word to show you Jesus. Number three, the letter A in Read, R-E-A-D. R stands for receive the word. It's a love letter from God to you. The E stands for expect to find Jesus. The letter A stands for apply the word to your daily life. See, if you don't apply it to your life, it won't help you. If it's just a, 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 an interesting thing from the past, it won't help you. You've got to take this, apply it to your life today. So that's why this verse is so exciting to me. In 2 Peter 1.4, he has given us his very great and precious promises. That's what this book is. It is a book full of promises. Do you know how many promises there are? Somebody counted 1,000. Somebody else counted 3,000. Somebody counted 5,000. I have no idea. But there are more than enough for everything you need in your life. Who can tell me? Just somebody shout out one of the promises that you know from the Bible that is meaningful for you. Anybody? What? <laughs> Say it again. 
I will never leave you nor forsake you. So what might I be feeling when I need to read that word? I might be feeling lonely. There's nobody who cares about me. I don't have any friends. Nobody loves me. Nobody cares if I live or die. All my friends have left me. My loved ones have died. I'm here all by myself. No, Hebrews 13 says, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. You see, you take the word and you apply it to your life. How about another one? How about this one? You're facing, uh, you, you get the bill in the mail and you look at your checking account and they don't match up. And there's a problem here. And you've got to get the car fixed. There's a verse in Philippians 4.19. It says, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Oh, something else is going on in my life and I'm scared. I get some bad news from the doctor and I'm feeling afraid. I read 2 Timothy 1 verse 7. It says, God has not given us a spirit of fear. You see, you take the word and you apply it to your situation. That's what one man did. His name was Russ Carter. He was a student at a military academy, and he always thought of himself as a Christian, but it wasn't until he had a medical problem that everything changed. He went to the doctor. The doctor said, there's nothing we can do for your heart. Nothing. You don't have much time left to live. So he went home, and he knelt before God, and he said, God, I don't know how much time I have, but the rest of the time I give my life to you. And then he said, I began reading the Bible, and he said, now all of a sudden the Bible became alive like never before. And he said, I saw all these Bible verses that said things like, I'm the Lord, your healer, and, and blessed be the God who, who forgives our sins and heals our diseases. And he said, I'm going to stand on these promises. Now he says, God, I don't know how you would heal me. I don't know if it'll be through medication. I don't know if it'll be through prayer. It might not even be in this life. It might be when I go to heaven. But God, I'm going to stand on your promises of what you've said. His heart grew stronger and completely healed. He went to medical school and became a doctor himself for the next 50 years. But he said, this is what I've learned. He said, I can't tell God how to do things. He said, it might be through medicine, it might be through prayer, it might be ha heaven, I don't know. But he says, I have learned to stand on the promises of God. He was also a musician, and he wrote the words of this song, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Powerful. It's not enough to know the promises. It's not enough to read the promises. We have to believe them and stand on them. The next verse printed on your message outline, Psalm 106, 12, it says, then they believed the promises and they sang his praise. Now let me clarify something that it's not saying. When we talk about believing these promises, it does not mean that if you say a verse enough times, uh, you can twist God's arm and make him do whatever you want. Oh, I thought I could do that. No, it doesn't work that way. I mean, that would be like going to the doctor with your medical problem, and uh, you've got a, a very serious condition. Uh, but the doctor says, I've got good news. I've got the cure. And you say to the doctor, oh, wonderful. Just give me the pill. A and the doctor says, I'm sorry, it's not a pill. It's surgery. Surgery? Doesn't that involve cutting? It could hurt. Just give me the pill. And, and give me the one that's uh, non-habit forming with no side effects because I've seen the TV commercial. You see, we can't do that with God, can we? we? We can't say to God, now I'll tell you, God, how to do it, and I'll tell you when to do it. No. All we can say is, God, I believe your promise. I believe you'll do it, but you'll do it in your time. That's why the next verse printed there on the message outline, Hebrews 6, 12, says this, through faith and patience we inherit what has been promised. Through faith. Faith is, I believe this word, but patience is, I'm waiting on God's timing. And the reality is, some of the promises of God will not take place in this life. 
There's a verse, it's not printed there, but you might make a note of this because it's such an interesting verse. It's in Hebrews 11, verse 13. Hebrews 11, verse 13. And it, it, it mentions a lot of people uh, who were believing God, but it says this about their situation. Hebrews 11, verse 13. Let me find it. It says, all these people were still living by faith when they died. All these people were still living by faith when they died. So that's, that's what we want to do. We want to keep our faith till the very end of our life. We want to keep believing in, God, in, in the Lord's promises uh, until we die. But then it says they did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. What that means is some of our prayers are going to be answered when we go to heaven. Isn't that right? It says there will be no more tears, no more pain, no more suffering. So I just want to encourage you, keep believing, keep waiting, and let God have the results. They're in His hands. Some of you know that uh, in my life, a year ago, God answered a prayer that I had been praying for over 50 years. I was adopted, didn't think I had any living family members, and a year ago found out that I had a sister living in Idaho. And this last May, last month, uh, June and Don came from Boise to visit us, and it was so thrilling. It was on Mother's Day weekend. What a perfect time, because here we have this mother in common. So God answered this prayer. My, my, we, 60, 68 years before I could meet my sister. That's incredible. My prayer had been for 50 years. When I was 18, I started praying, God, do I have any family? Let me meet them. Do I have a mother somewhere out there? Do I have any siblings? So after 50 years, God answered my prayer. I got to meet my sister. But then the sad thing was, she said, but mother died. And I had wanted so much to meet my mother. And, and, I, and I thought, I, I want to tell her, thank you for giving me life. And most of all, I want to tell her about Jesus because I want her to go to heaven. But my sister said, our mother loved Jesus, and she is in heaven. And it's like, wow, so God answered part of my prayer in this life. I got to meet my sister. But the rest of that promise will take place when I go to heaven, and that's true in your life. Don't be discouraged that you don't see the answers right now. God's in charge of the timing. Your job is simply to keep believing Take it off from your shoulders. You see, if you're trying to make it happen, take it off from your shoulders and put it on God's shoulders. Let him be in charge. All you have to do is wait with patience. Now, some of you might say, you don't understand, Bill. I have waited. I have prayed. I have believed. I, I can't keep going. There, there is not a prayer left inside of me. How do I get more faith? Here's the amazing thing. It says in Romans 10, 17, faith comes from hearing the word. What? Everything that the Bible asks you to do, the Bible gives you the power to do it. What? Yes. So when it says have faith, it says if you'll continue to read the word, the word will give you faith. I don't understand how it works. But no matter how discouraged you are, no matter how helpless you are, no matter how hopeless your situation, if you will keep reading the Word and believing the Word, it will give you strength and it will give you faith. The letter D in read stands for this, desire, desire the Word as your great treasure. It says in Psalm 19.10, God's words are more to be desired, are more precious than gold. And Psalm 119.162 says, I rejoice in your promise, in your word, like one who finds great treasure or spoil. Uh, I remember before we moved here, I think it was like around 2013, hearing about a couple that lived not too far from here, and they were out walking one day in their backyard, walking with their dog, walking on a path they had walked many, many times. But on this particular day, Mary looked down, and she saw sticking out of the ground a little piece of metal. And so she took a stick and began pushing around it. She said, there's something in there. She called her, her husband, John, and they began to dig this thing up, and it was a tin can, and alongside of it, seven others filled with gold coins, uncirculated coins from the mid-1800s worth 10 million dollars. 
Now it says we have a greater treasure than that. His word is more valuable than all that gold. Well, the interviewer asked Mary, do you have any last words to share with us about finding the greatest buried treasure ever found in North America? And she said, whatever answers you seek, they may be right at home. The answer to our difficulties was right there under our feet. If you believe God's word, if you're standing on his promises, the answer to your difficulties is right under your feet. Stand on the word. It's your greatest treasure. Last year, we studied the book of Job, and Job said this. He said, I've treasured the words of his mouth more than my daily food. I mean, I love to eat, but the word is the most important nourishment that I receive every day. One of my heroes was Martin Luther, the great reformer of the 16th century. He had this to say about the word. He said, as soon as I, I look at a psalm or uh, some other scripture, it, it shines and it burns into my heart, and I, I get a whole different spirit and, and mind. I know that everyone can experience this same thing in his own life, Luther said. And then he said, hear God's word often. Do not go to bed. Do not get up without having spoken a beautiful passage to your heart. There is something about the word that you want to do it before you go to bed, before you do anything in the morning. The word is our highest treasure. Finally, Jeremiah said, when your words came, I ate them, and they were my joy and my delight. The more you spend time in God's Word, the more delightful it will be. I guarantee you it will go from a duty to a delight. I have been studying this book now for 50 years. It's changed my life. It's renewed my mind. It's healed my body and soul. It's brought me into a fellowship with the Holy Spirit, a closeness to Jesus, and into the very loving heart of the Heavenly Father. And I know God can do the same thing for you if you will read the Bible. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you gave us a book that's alive a book that has power to change us, a book that brings us your forgiveness and your compassion and your strength and your power. And Lord, I pray for us in our weakness that you would be our strength. I pray that you would increase in each one of us a hunger and a thirst for your living word. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.